It's said that memories are the architecture of our identity. But how is our identity affected by the buildings and monuments that surround us? In these stones, history is stored. It's more than a memory, it's a map of memory. And memories of another time lie in wait. I wouldn't want to erase it, I wouldn't want to repress it, we just need to face it. History is history. But what do these witnesses of stone mean to us today? What stories do they tell? Architecture can never be divorced, can never be severed from its history. The buildings we live and work in become a part of us, and we are part of them. Stones can speak. Bricks and mortar become so much more than the cement and stone that hold them together. But as divisions grow across Europe, should it matter who was behind the construction of these monuments? All political regimes try and reflect their values in their buildings. Architecture was the means of the fascists to change the image, the imagination of the city. Winston Churchill once said, we shape our buildings and thereafter our buildings shape us. But what happens when we live among buildings whose stories we don't want to shape our lives? When Churchill uttered those words, he was at war with Nazi Germany, a regime that in a few months would meet its reckoning. But a regime that would also cement its legacy through its architecture for decades to come. An era of military power, of political power, and also of cultural power. Buildings beyond their materiality, become this present reminder of the past. You have to handle somehow your history, and this is a part of the history. But if our buildings really do shape us, then what is the legacy of fascist architecture? I'm Miriam Francois, and I've journeyed across Europe to try and make sense of the memories that linger in these buildings. Decades after the fall of European fascism, how have people come to terms with what they represent? I'll head to Italy, where Mussolini sought to recapture the grandeur of ancient Rome. And I'll head to the heart of the Third Reich and the buildings that housed it. I'll speak to those living in the shadows of fascist architecture, those who spent decades trying to understand their place in today's world. Should they be left to crumble? Or are they an important reminder of some of the darkest chapters of European history? This is the story of those witnesses of stone. Germany and Italy, two countries shaped by fascism in the 1930s. Both countries had leaders who built their way to power, their ideals reflected in their architecture. Symmetry and simplicity, enormity and intimidation. Mussolini and Hitler both built as a reminder of their absolute power. They were very transfixed by the idea that somehow they were creating the great empires of the past, the Roman Empire, the, the Greek Empire. But today, both these countries deal with the legacy of their fascist buildings in entirely different ways. I'm starting my journey here in South Tyrol, a small region on the border of Austria and Italy nestled in the Alps. The question of what to do with fascist architecture is particularly contentious here in South Tyrol, not least because of its very unique history. Here, the architecture is a reminder of deep historical divisions which continue to plague the present. The originally Austrian region was annexed by Italy after the First World War, Fascist leader Benito Mussolini implemented a plan to Italianize South Tyrol and German speakers were stripped of many of their rights. At the heart of his efforts was this arch, built at the personal request of Mussolini himself. It embodies the ideals of fascist architecture, 
oversized, grand, imposing, and what to do with this controversial arch today continues to divide the people of this town. When you have uh, contentious architecture, uh, you have to, to handle it. And there were, in our region, there were very different opinions uh, how uh, to deal with it. Uh, there were a lot of people who said uh, we, we should just wreck it, to put it uh, down, um, because this was this fascist symbol. But we, have, we had, or we have uh, a community, Italian-speaking community, for them, or for some of them, this was part, or is part, of their um, identity. I've come here to see Bolzano's Victory Arch for myself. I was joined by Christian Coleman, a member of the South Tyrolean Freedom Party. They say the arch glorifies fascism. Every time we pass here, we are forcibly reminded of, uh, of the fascist ideology and of the, of the conquest of South Tyrol by Italy. And we say um, fascism should not be glorified on the surface. It should be, let's say, banned into the cellar or into a museum. Taxpayers' money is being used to renovate these monuments, something that Christian Coleman has campaigned against. Bolton has a majority of 70% of Italians, and the majority of these Italian citizens are still not able to distance themselves from, from, from fascism, from the fascist ideology. They tend to reinterpret fascism as a, a cultural enrichment. He wants to see fascist sculptures here moved, a request the council dismissed, saying they had artistic and cultural value. Speaking to Christian Coleman, it's pretty clear that the architectural legacy of fascism here in Bolzan, Bolzano, is still very raw. Just above us is the Victory Arch, which stands at the center of the square. It's just been renovated. Um, it really has center stage in this town. And below it, in this cellar, slightly hidden away, to be fair, is the documentation center, which offers the historical background to it. But you can see why, to him, as someone from the German-speaking minority here, it feels like the monuments to fascism continue to celebrate that ideology at a time where his identity or the identity that he represents is still struggling to be recognized. The South Tyrol authorities face a very current challenge. Here, the legacy of these buildings continues to stoke political tensions, and that's proved complicated in a region that has seen a recent rise of neo-fascist parties. But preserving the region's Italian history does mean preserving the fascist architecture. Next stop, Italy's capital. Rome. It's hard to imagine a city more defined by its architecture. It's also a city that embodies empire. The architecture reflected that classical style from Roman and Greek times. Uh, and that was a statement about how powerful they thought the empires were that they were creating and how long they might last. And it was these echoes of empire that Mussolini drew on when he set about remoulding the city in the 1930s. So what he's trying to do is really re-establish Rome as a valid and contemporary uh, power and voice in the new world order. Um, he's also uh, trying to kind of recreate the Roman spirit through sport, through the army, through education. There's a lot of things that were actually positive that he did, uh, which are, are hard to remember because he did so many bad things. Catherine showed me around the EUR district, Mussolini's brainchild and now a trendy neighborhood. As I walked among these structures, nearly 75 years after the regime's end, I realized that the physical legacy of fascism is deeply woven into this city's DNA. Mussolini's vision feels very present here. Just like his ancient predecessors, his buildings were all about scale and the projection of power. 
the style is always going to bring you back to ancient Rome. Uh, he sees himself as a new Augustus. And this is a new dawn for Roman civilization. Rome is going to be great again. Breathe! If I look really small in relation to these columns, that's because that's exactly what they were intended to convey. That is the size and strength of the state in relation to the individual. Dwarfed by a state designed to inspire fear and submission. This, perhaps the most famous road in Italy, was built by Mussolini in the 1920s as a marching ground. This street behind me, Via di Fori Imperiale, runs through the center of Rome, and it's how Mussolini stamped his name across the city. Now, a few years ago, there was a debate over whether it should be closed down, but interestingly, that wasn't about the fascist legacy behind it, but about the logistics of how people would get to work and about air pollution. I've come to Rome's Jewish Quarter, an area which was profoundly affected by Mussolini's racial laws in 1938. As the fascist leader aligned with Nazi Germany, so too did his policies. At least 8,000 Jews were deported from the Italian capital, many of them to Auschwitz. Here, there are no vast structures. Instead, there's an attempt to counter the legacy of fascism one stone at a time. They were laid to remember those killed or deported. Small stones that have been inserted in front of doorsteps where Jewish families were taken away. But these small stones create this architectural reminder of the history that's taken place. I met an Italian Jewish artist who studied all 207 of these so-called stumbling stones. People, they don't want to know what happened. They prefer to live quiet, not to know. Say, Italiani brava gente. It means Italians are good people. Because all the horrible things, they happen abroad, they happen in Germany, they were in Poland, and it was because of Nazi, not because of fascists. And instead, it's not true. It's more than a memory, it's a map of memory. I've come to the heart of the Civic Center to meet a man who began his political career in a neo-fascist party, a past he has since renounced. In 2008, he was elected mayor of Rome. Sul versante storico va fatto un discorso a mio avviso diverso. Le epoche storiche non possono mai essere cancellate anche quando vengono giudicate negativamente. E le faccio un esempio, secondo me, evidente. Il Colosseo, quando esisteva nell'impero romano, era un luogo in cui venivano, eh, furono uccisi i cristiani, furono trucidate le persone, avvennero cose molto gravi, ma nessuno oggi pensa di demolire il Colosseo nonostante quello che rappresentava, cioè sostanzialmente un luogo di... Mussolini remade the urban landscape as only a few before him had. Many of the people I met in Italy are personally engaged with this history, but for most Romans, it seems these buildings are just the backdrop to their busy lives. I wondered how Germany, the former heart of the Third Reich, was dealing with its architectural legacy, and that's my next stop. I'm traveling now to Nuremberg and to perhaps the most infamous site of fascist architecture, the Zeppelinfeld the home of Nazi propaganda and a site synonymous with the hate speech of Adolf Hitler. Here, he held vast rallies addressing his thousands of supporters. It was a place that would, in later years, come to symbolize the atrocities of Nazism. You know, these were buildings that were put up to make a statement. Yes, they had a, they had a purpose, they had a function, but they were there to demonstrate how the Nazis saw themselves and how they believed there was a link to previous history and how they believed these buildings would represent a regime that they thought would last a thousand years. 
and architecture that is doing many things at once and certainly a lot of that has to do with power structures whether that's done through large scales open spans lighting in the case of Nuremberg was also very important and sheer numbers by filling these spaces full of people people become they can palpably feel something that they might think is larger than themselves Some want the Nuremberg complex to be left to crumble. Others want it preserved as a warning from history. I'm meeting Florian Deal, head of the Nuremberg Museum. He's tasked with managing Nuremberg's controversial legacy. Young people can't remember the Nazi time, of course, so these witnesses of stone are the very good way to keep in close contact with history. Every year, authorities have to spend tens of thousands to shore up masonry to make the site safe. This sign up here is warning visitors that they're entering at their own peril. And the reason for that is maybe quite obvious. The entire site is crumbling, the rocks are falling apart. Now there's been a big debate here in Nuremberg about what to do with the site. Should it be renovated or not? And to what extent? And the key issue is of course that it's a politically sensitive location. This is where just behind me Adolf Hitler would address the masses. And it's a lot of money involved, 73 million euros, which some people here believe could be better spent elsewhere. But can you turn something that represents past horrors into a place of beauty or even positivity? Can these buildings be given a new story? I'm meeting two German philosophers, Reinhard Knott and Christoph Popp, who are among a number of academics and historians who object to the current plans for renovation. I would prefer to have gardens for 73 million euros. This would give back this ground to peace. This was a place where war was planned and propagated, so it could be a place where friendship and gardens and love can be propagated. They want to see the buildings repurposed with a message just as powerful as the ideas which led to their creation. They told me of a former Nazi building repurposed in a particularly unusual way. Of all the places that I've visited, I really feel like this one captures the dilemma of fascist architecture. Basically, if you don't engage with the history of a building, you end up with this, munching on your burger in a former Nazi building. So one of the criticisms you often hear about the restoration of fascist architecture is a concern that it'll end up beautifying things that probably shouldn't be beautified. And so here at the Documentation Centre they've made a really strong effort to try and distinguish the materials that are used here. So modern materials for the building itself, like this cement floor, which are actually very distinct here. You know, they've left an actual separation from the wall, which is of course part of the original structure of the Congress Hall, which was of course built by the Nazis. One person was trusted above all others with implementing Hitler's vision. The man behind me is Albert Speer. He was Hitler's favorite architect and a close friend. He was the man that was tasked with bringing the Nazi ideals to life in structures like the one in which I'm standing now. Now, drawing on the example of ancient Rome, he wanted to create an enduring legacy for Nazi ideals. And the one thing that pretty much everyone here agrees on is that whatever happens to these buildings, they can't be allowed to fulfill that objective. Speer understood that his works would have significance for many years to come. In fact, he designed them to last for a thousand years. He wanted to leave a lasting legacy of iconic ruins. Standing here in the rally grounds, it's easy to imagine Hitler stood right there at the rostrum, addressing his crowds of adoring supporters. History feels very present here in Nuremberg, but that isn't the case elsewhere in Germany.
Berlin, Germany's capital and once the heart of Hitler's Nazi empire. In 1937, Hitler asked Albert Speer to transform Berlin into a vast metropolis. To build a new capital of Germania to dwarf all other cities. It was a grand vision of stone and steel, of clean straight lines and imposing scales, designed to send a message to the world of power and might. The aim of Hitler and Albert Speer was to conquer this city, to conquer this international metropolis of modern culture, to conquer it and to redefine it. Reminders of the Nazis' ambition of empire building can be found across Berlin. Many of the buildings are now almost unrecognizable in both form and function, their dark stories hidden behind new, more hopeful ones. This is where the Summer Olympics of 1936 were held. Hitler saw the Games as a propaganda opportunity and he had this place built to showcase his ideals of racial supremacy. Now, these days, players and supporters from all around the world gather here and the ideals which fueled its construction seem like a distant echo. And that's also true of Germany's vast finance ministry in the center of Berlin. It once housed Hitler's aviation ministry. After the war, eagles and swastikas were removed as part of denazification efforts. But its imposing size still hints at its fascist design, making it impossible to completely forget its past. And today, it houses the nerve center of Europe's economic powerhouse. Not far from the former Nazi aviation ministry is Tempelhof Airport. Intended as a symbol of Hitler's world capital, its hangars are still some of the largest built structures in the world. Today, it houses hundreds of Syrian refugees, and what was once Hitler's runway has now been repurposed. I've rarely had stranger experiences in my life to walk down an abandoned runway with people either side of me, either barbecuing, roller skating, kite surfing, and indeed when you throw into the mix the, the very dark Nazi past of the building, it just sort of takes on an additional significance in my opinion. People are generally aware of what went on here. They know it's a, a former Nazi airport, for example, but that doesn't mean that they don't want to reclaim this territory in a way, to use it for purposes than it was otherwise intended. Tempelhof has been reimagined to fit with Germany's modern, inclusive identity, one which refuses to forget the past, but instead uses it to forge a brighter future. When Italy and Germany joined forces in 1939, they realized that power in Europe would mean exerting cultural influence. The regime set about molding European civilization to match their vision. These buildings and monuments will forever reflect those ambitions. With the resurgence of right-wing groups, divisions over these structures reflects divisions at the very heart of Europe. There is still a threat from racist, fascist ideology in the 21st century in various parts of the world, so it's absolutely crucial that we continue to learn those lessons from history. And I think properly memorialising the sites of Nazi Germany and properly interpreting and explaining what happened is really important. These buildings with strong ideological ties to the past, I think they need to be problematized and their historic legacy ever more today than before needs to be acknowledged. Every structure tells a story but can the stories of fascist buildings be rewritten, either as a warning from history or blank slates on which a new future can be written? We tried to change the attitude of this architecture by adding things that make them lighter. Quite a few of the buildings have got a new life. 
So the Olympic Stadium, for example, which of course will always be associated with the Hitler Olympics of 1936, but actually that building has been rebuilt twice really since the Nazi period and is actually, in my view, rather a fine stadium. The stories of these monuments can be deeply personal. For some, because of their past. For others, their present. With Europe at a critical juncture, divided over its identity and future direction, how we manage the symbols of a not-so-distant past becomes a measure of our current ideals. What I've come to realise on this journey is that buildings from the past continue to influence the present. Architecture necessarily impacts how we see the world, but the ideas behind them can be and often are subverted. The fascist regimes of Hitler and Mussolini had certain intentions, but really it's up to us how we respond to and move away from that legacy. Now more than ever, we need to listen to the stories being told to us by these witnesses of stone.